My passion, so Amanda's passion, is leading people to become the best versions of themselves. It's not heating and cooling. It's not being the owner of a company. I'm a visionary at heart, but people are at the center of what I do. Everybody is uniquely different and learning to lead from a perspective of leading each person and meeting them where they're at, not where their team is at, not where the department is at, not where you know everyone is at as a whole. It is each individual and you have to dial it right into that individual person themselves. Hey, how's it going? It's Tim Brown, and this is the Plumbing and HVAC Hustle Podcast. And today I have Amanda Triolo of Grasshopper Heating and Air Conditioning, Heating and Cooling, excuse me. And we just took the tour of your office. Yep. Incredible. Thank you. And how long have you guys been around? So Grasshopper itself will be three years old on February 1st of 2024. Incredible. And where were you before that? Like another local company or? Yeah, before that. I mean, we've always, we've, we're still the same company, mm -hmm. uh, just rebranded, right? I've been around since January 1st of 2016. Okay. We are commercial construction install only. And when COVID happened, of course, it gave us a new story and the brand launched February 1st, 2021. Okay. So I have a, a friend, a client of mine in Minnesota who one of the first things he sent me um, as I was getting into HVAC, you know, from traditionally hook has been roofing. Mm -hmm. Um, he sent me a video of you and your culture and your kickoff um, really? for the year. And he said, this is kind of what I'm trying to do with my company. Wow. That's incredible. And so you're inspiring people out there with the, the vibes yeah. and with the culture. So how, what would you say is kind of a, what is what's motivating to you about creating a, a, strong culture and really a distinct vibe? Yeah, that's a great question. So my passion, so Amanda's passion is leading people to become the best versions of themselves. It's not heating and cooling. It's not being the owner of a company. I'm a visionary at heart, but people are at the center of what I do. And so being able to have a way in which I'm able to help make other people's life change become a pivotal point in their life. And it happens to be through the trades and through HVAC. It's an amazing opportunity that I get to have every single day. And when you or you're able to create an organization, you know, the first half of our mission statement is we create opportunities that change lives. That's my commitment to my people. Leading people to make a great decision is the second half. And that's what we do. Yeah. Our mission statement is not what we do. It's who we are as mm -hmm. a company and being able to provide life change like at the end of the day especially after covid people are looking for a place that they enjoy going to that they're supported mm -hmm. that they're appreciated and that there's a path for them mm. for people to be able to see a path for themselves is super important mm. you're going to lose people along the way you know we've created what's called the forward expedition program here where if somebody's feeling stuck or somebody wants to get to the next level or somebody wants to make six figures or say you want to make a million dollars Whatever that looks like, we, we are committed to each and every teammate here to create the pathway to help them get to there. Would you say you are one of the employers of choice in your area? Absolutely. That, I think that should be our topic for this podcast. So cool. reintroducing this podcast, <laughs> how to become the employer of choice in your area. I think it goes beyond the industry, mm -hmm. right? I think like the best employers don't care what industry they're in. Right. Really? No. Sounds like you're just trying to create an excellent place to work and support your team's goals. Just watching that like vision board wall, like mm -hmm. the essentially like for the people that haven't watched the tour is like a, a hallway with everyone's kind of vision yeah. for the next few years. And they present it to the team of what they're trying to do. And I think that that just speaks to this, how do you get your people on board emotionally? Yeah. It's just hard. It is. Because people, there's like a thing in culture right now where it's like your employer is kind of, they, they almost like mistreat the employer. Like the employer oh. is unimportant and we kind of take it for granted. Right. Meaningful work. Mm -hmm. So how do you, be, like, uh, can you just explain what that program is around the vision boards yeah. first? So at the center of this company is the word care. Okay. We are actually in business for our people. Our people are at the center of every single decision that we make and us focusing on our people ensures that they're able to live their best life 
which means that those vision boards right outside my window, I love the fact that my office is actually stationed right here because this is why I do what I do right outside the mm. window, right? Understanding what their one year, three year and five year goals are for each individual teammate here is one of the most important things that we could possibly do as a company because if you don't understand what's important to your people and what motivates them, you're gonna lose them along the way mm -hmm. because it's no longer of, yep, uh, everybody wants to make two grand a week or you wanna make five grand a week. I have people here that make 14, 15 grand a week depending on what their role is, but it is what motivates them. For some people, it's time with their family. For some people, it's a dream vacation. For some people, it's a dream home. For some people, it's making a ton of money so they can go buy whatever they want. It's mm -hmm. financial freedom. You know, we saw the vision board earlier. It was being able to pay for his funeral and have that money put aside so it's not his family's burden when it gets to that point. Everybody is uniquely different and learning to lead from a perspective of leading each person and meeting them where they're at, not where their team is at, not where the department is at, not where you know everyone is at as a whole. It is each individual and you have to dial it right into that individual person themselves. So let's say somebody wanted to, let's just do a little how to, to set up this program where they did the vision boards. What would be the step by step, a few steps to, to implement that at somebody's company? Yeah, I'd say, you know, if you have 30 plus employees, I would start um, department to department because you don't want to roll it out at once. It'll take a little bit of time to get through and you want to be very intentional. Have a meeting with your team and just say, look, this year I'm committed to understanding what's important to you and your families and how I can help make those things possible. But to be totally transparent with you, employers aren't going to be able to accomplish that until they, what the, they say what they mean and that their actions align. So it's doing what you say you're gonna do, and then what are your values as a company? Is every decision that you make pointed back to your values? If it's not, then you don't really have a foundation as a company, and if you don't have a mission statement, and for, so, for when you walk through the door here, you know what mission you're living out every single day, if you don't have that, you truly don't have the foundational building blocks to be able to accomplish something like that because it means that your people aren't at the center of what you do. It could be profit at the center of what you do. It could be building and scaling and just moving on, and you have to find out what's important to you, but I'm talking to the people right now, I guess, just to be fully transparent, where people are important to them. Make it about what's important to them. You know, I walked into a company, uh, I don't know, a year or so ago, and on the wall it said, one team, one dream. And I thought to myself, you know, that's not at all how I operate my company. My, how I operate my company is one team, a million dreams, mm. because that's what it's about. And so really just go to Staples, go to Office Max, grab some posters. We, we have them already. Uh, for us, after their 90-day, we have them... Grab a poster, take it home, lay out their one year, three year, five year goals. We invite their families to participate with them because, you know, sometimes it's a family unit that's important and sometimes they're like, no, I want this to be about me. However they think is best for them, just encourage them to go ahead and do it. For some people, they've never literally written their goals down. They don't know what's important to them because they've never thought that far ahead. So it's actually an awesome exercise to be able to even just start step one of getting them emotionally invested but you're only gonna get them emotionally invested when they start to see and feel, but forget about the word see. It's when they start to feel that you are committed to them and you are committed to helping their dreams come true mm -hmm. as well. What we love to do is we love to be able to go through these publicly. So the entire company will meet at a Tuesdays with Grasshopper and they share and we celebrate them and we everybody understands what's important. And then you gotta do the flip side of that too. When they cross something off their vision board and when they accomplish something, celebrate the heck out of it because that's one of the most rewarding days of your career. Mm, I love it. What's so special about this conference is the fact that it's so intimate compared to others out there where you have hundreds of people where you can barely get FaceTime. The subject matter experts that we have here, it's just unmatched. There's hundreds of different groups out there, but not all groups do it the same way. And you're gonna learn something different here that can implement in your business. If you guys aren't at this event, what we just went over today with Joe Cressera step-by-step with a call-by-call, is amazing. If your team is struggling with installations, with getting guys to perform, got to be at this event for Joe Cacera. What are some of the other things that you feel like have positioned you guys as an employer of choice in your area? You know, employer of choice, the more I think about it, is a little bit of a unique way of saying it, right? Because we're not the employer for everyone. Mm -hmm. We've got six values as a company, and those six values are how we hire. If we ever have to hire, 
that's how we make our decisions. And if you know, we say yes or no to business, that's what we run the decision through is the values. And so, you know, our biggest value, our most, um, probably our most uh, fan favorite value is we choose growth. And so we are a company that's committed to growing both as an organization, but our people as well. Okay. So it's something that we all take on when you're a grasshopper, that's a value that you take on is you choose growth. There's some people that are stagnant in their career. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Cause I actually had somebody in the workshop. I brought in a coach and there, we were doing like a workshop and yeah. the person said, I don't, they were talking about growth like that. Yeah. And the person said, I don't, want to do that. like I'm really they essentially said no yeah <laughs> and our core values mm -hmm. that kind of goes directly against our core values isn't yeah. it weird though to have to fire somebody yeah for a core value mm -hmm. when they're actually their work is fine have you ever done that yeah isn't that um, weird I just feel like that's difficult it is extremely difficult look I just had to turn down a five million dollar sales guy because he wasn't a cultural fit his performance was there. I'm sure the levels he could help take us to in our 2024 goals were there. I've interviewed him a few times and he's ready to make the jump. And it was that final interview. And it's like, we commit every day to be a team player. That's also one of our values. And we just didn't see it. And it was very evident that that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. And we actually had to make the decision to say, we're not going to offer a position on this one. Terrifying though, it, isn't it? It is, but uh, being able to take the culture and hold the culture at the center of what we do and keep the people at the center of what we do is one of the most important things that we could do as an organization. Yeah, because a disruptive person or if they're not going to be a team yeah. player can really throw more more often. It doesn't make up for the five million revenue or whatever. No, it yeah. doesn't. And they stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. And to be honest, if one of, if leadership doesn't catch it, an employee is bringing it to our attention and we're catching it quickly because they're like, hey, this person's not a fit here. So it's very evident when somebody's not a fit. And you know, we never want to be in a position to actually have to fire someone. You know, our plumbing manager, I introduced you to Emilio. We had this running joke. We interviewed him seven times before we offered him the position just to make sure that was the right fit. I mean, growing a department that we never had that exist that never existed here is not a light task. So making sure we brought on the right candidate who would be able to lead at the levels we lead, lead at, like, look, I'm not like every organization here. Grasshopper is different. And we truly do put the people at the center of what we do. And especially for my leadership team, if I bring someone onto my leadership team here, they've got to understand my vision for leadership and you never turn it off. And we lead from the front. And for some people, they're not willing to lead from the front. And that's fine. But that doesn't mean that they're a leader for Grasshopper. I appreciate that. Yeah, some people want to lead but don't want to do the work. They don't want the sacrifices that comes yeah. with leadership, but to lead is to serve. Yeah, and it's also, you kind of recognize very quickly, it's tough because as a leader, you're taking responsibility for stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to see somebody that's a high performer that doesn't yeah. take responsibility for the whole thing. Right. They could kind of complain about the process when technically they are part of creating the process. Yeah and that they have the freedom to continue to craft the process. Exactly. And so I just I just try to remind my people so often, you're creating this. Yeah. If you kind of hate it. Yes. You're part of it. Yes. We have a we have something we say pretty often it's um centralized vision, decentralized decision making. Mm. So um, they understand the vision and where we're headed as a company and we give them the ability to make their own decisions and to pivot when they need to for the, uh, the obviously the integrity of their team, but for the greater benefit of the company as well. I love that. So we actually, we actually empower them to be the one in charge of their decisions. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones coming up with the process. Look, I had somebody, um, we use Marco Polo now. I don't know if you know what that is, the app on I your phone. I think so, yeah. Isn't it for couples normally? Uh, or families at that? I don't know. We use might it as a, a team. Different, might be a different one. We use it as a team. Okay. Instead of sending yeah. emails sometimes and getting daunting yeah. emails, sometimes we just hit each other with Marco yeah. Polos. Yeah. And we had, I had a guy who was like, hey, man, uh, I'm thinking about trying. Da, da, da. And I said, you know what, Luke? Don't even worry about explaining it to me if you believe in it. And if it's something that you want to try, take it and yeah. run with it. Let me know how it works out. You've got to be able to empower your people yeah. or else, like me as the owner of the company, what good is it if, I, if everybody has to run their decisions by me? That's not a good leader. So mm -hmm. I empower people. My hope is that they do fail from time to time mm -hmm. because they're going to be able to learn from those lessons. Like Luke was telling you earlier, my only request is that they always start with why and then get to what. People have to understand the why before you hit them with the what. Mm. 
That's so good. Yeah. I, so in our organization, we call it Kaizen. Have you heard that? It's a, I think it's a Japanese term. It's like comes from manufacturing. Okay. Essentially, the idea that like the people in the front line of the manufacturing plant or whatever have to be able to make decisions. Otherwise, it's too bureaucratic yeah. to go all the way up. Mm -hmm. So it's like that, that exact concept of empowering people on the front lines Love to it. make decisions and create process. Question around um, if you're, you're wanting to go to 100 million. Yeah, you know, that's a beautiful question. Actually, Tim, I actually was on a podcast yesterday and I had a little bit of a change of heart. Mm -hmm. So I had to do a lot of soul searching on what is my vision and what is important to me. And if you heard me on a podcast last year, my goal was to get to 100 million in five years, right? Mm -hmm. I said that on a podcast about a year ago, last month. And uh, the last few months, I've really done a hard reflection on what does that mean? And I no longer want to grow to become a $100 million company. Um, my belief is that you could be a $100 million company and still only make $100,000 net because you don't run a healthy organization. Mm -hmm. And so I have looked at, well, what does that mean for Grasshopper? And what it means is that my, my goals simply have just shifted. I want to be the best but I want to be the healthiest organization that's out there in the home service industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you saw the post I put up on Facebook not too long ago, but I'm naming 2024 the year of profit. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that, does, does that mean that Grasshopper doesn't make profit? No, we're a very healthy organization, but I'm committed to getting to a high EBITDA percentage, like probably one of the industry's highest is my goal. Mm -hmm. And how do I get there? It's, it's innovating, so this is the year of innovation for me. It's a year of refining our purchasing, exactly who we choose to do business with, where we lock in pricing, where we negotiate rebates, what kind of terms do we have, and then really using as much artificial intelligence and eliminating as many inefficiencies to be able to gain as many efficiencies as possible. And so if I can continue innovating to the best of my ability in the home service industry and really pioneer that innovation in a trade that is a bit behind on the innovation side of things, I believe that I truly could be able to be one of the world's great, healthiest organizations. Hmm. I love that. I think one of the things that I've seen that you're doing really well is reaching out to the rest of the HVAC community. Mm -hmm. And like you're trying to help people along mm -hmm. the way. You're also, you're inspiring people. And yeah. so people just commenting on my post about coming out here, just saying like, wow, she's really doing some cool things. And it really does have an effect on yeah. the perception in the yeah. industry and, and things like that. Yeah. Perception yeah. is a great word and I didn't mean to cut you off there, but perception is one of the, the greatest words, but also the greatest, uh, I'd say fall on social media mm -hmm. because you have, people have such a perception of $50 million companies, $100 million companies, but you could be a $20 million company and still be evaluated very damn near close to a $100 million company just by simply having a healthy, profitable organization running efficiently are you running at optimum efficiency do you understand your kpis do you understand numbers do you understand marketing do you understand where you have money just rolling out the window and where you can maximize opportunities in front of you and so unfortunately it is that perception of that those high revenue dollars when revenue isn't beauty right ebitda is actually beauty so how do we work ourselves to be able to become the best through that and you know something that i've said as well on podcasts is I wanted to plant a few grasshopper locations throughout the Northeast and I'm really kind of having a change of heart that I don't know if I want to do that. And mm -hmm. I'm evaluating what the future of grasshopper looks like because the team of people I've created here, like, you know, we went through together. They're my people, like these people inside of grasshopper, they are my people. And I'm not really motivated by going and creating another team in multiple different places. So instead I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating what does it look like to unite and continue bringing together and stronger the team that I have and reaching more people with Grasshopper. There's a big question mark on that right now. I don't know the answer quite yet, but it doesn't look like me building more teams. It looks like hmm. being innovative and coming up with a way that'll work for us. You know, our, our tagline forward is a way of life. Grasshopper is only move in a forward direction. I don't know if you knew that or not, but mm -hmm. that's the beauty. I do from you, I yeah. think, yeah. That's the beauty of who we are, right? Yeah. Is that, you know, in life, sometimes you can take two steps backwards if it means being able to move forward again. And that resonates with a lot of people. We've got a strong mission and our values are how we operate by it. So how can I continue reaching more people by not having to grow more teams mm -hmm. and, and spread myself even more thin? So we've been mentioning EBITDA and yeah. valuations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. 
So is there like an ideal timeline from your perspective that you would want to sell Grasshopper at some point? Like, is there like, is, if, if not at all, that's interesting, 20 years, yeah. 10 years, three years, is there anything like that in the horizon? I don't have a timeline, to be honest with you, Tim. I love waking up every day and coming here and getting to do what I get to do. Every day is exciting. And then, you know, we're, we're growing verticals now. So plumbing soon will be expanding into electric after we master plumbing a bit. And for me, it's like, I don't have an end in sight quite yet. I do know that our, our, our mission is strong and we're just getting started, it feels like. I don't know what that means. So I'm excited to listen back to this five years from now and be like, okay, five, year, five years ago, Amanda had no idea what life would look like now. But you know, I'm not really interested in selling anytime soon. We're having, we're having an awesome time. I'm committed to my people and I wanna be able to grow to new heights along with them. How many times a day do you get that email? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Okay, is that crazy? A lot. Um, okay, so let's let's pivot back to the being an employer of choice thing a little bit. But by the way, I, I love to hear that you're planning on keeping it for a long time. I'm kind of a like, if we're making a lot of money and we're having a good time, like that's mm -hmm. what we should be focused on kind of. Like those are yeah. some, some of the things I like to focus on. Yeah. Um, why sell it? You know what I mean? Like why? But I mean, I get it. I get the giant... Yeah like check but I just also see some people floundering afterwards or like lacking purpose and yeah. I guess right now I just feel like my purpose yeah. is wrapped up in building a cool company and brand there you go I mean same with me you know I've, we've talked about my people almost this entire time if I were to just up and sell anytime soon it's like what would that mean for my people mm -hmm. and I am personally committed to them and I'm professionally committed to them and if I were to ever do that um, yeah I have no idea what that would look like mm -hmm. but um, I'm having fun. I have no plans of stopping anytime soon. Mm. I'm only 30 years old, so I, I've got a lot of ground left to cover. <laughs> that's incredible. I yeah. did not realize you're, that's amazing. Yeah. That's quick. Quick. You wouldn't think somebody that has this size of a company would be that age. Just getting started, Tim. Let's go. I love it. <laughs> okay. So, um, how about for you? I guess that's a, an interesting angle on the, like creating an employer choice, but what is, so motivating about this for you personally and what do you enjoy the most like day to day what are the types of things that you love doing the types of things that i love doing is celebrating wins but also celebrating failures too and some people are like amanda what the hell are you talking about because it's actually in those failures where the true beauty comes and beautiful things are built from that um you know i say you know kara we met her up front right you're going to fail one time, but you're going to learn and you're not going to make that mistake again. And then it's going to teach you to have a new outlook on how you do your job. And then this big bubble around it. I'm like, okay, I've learned my parameters here and I've learned what happens when you do this. And that actually helps us set them up for greater success so that when we're celebrating those wins, there is so much involved in that celebration because you're actually celebrating those failures too. You're mm. celebrating, man, you remember when I had like 14 $0 tickets and I just couldn't get it right. It's like, yeah, bro, I remember. And it's like, now I just closed out my first platinum repair for $5,200, whatever it is. It's like, mm. sure, you can, we don't celebrate the dollar amounts. We celebrate the failures because mm. we celebrate the wins, but we celebrate the failures because through those wins was all those times that they were practicing, right? So we talk about basketball. You're practicing in basketball practice. You're getting the play down. You're putting the work in. Then when the game comes and you're able to execute that play and make the, make the basket, celebrate the heck out of that because all that was born out of those hard practices that got you there how about big mistakes how about executive level mistakes like do you like you what? got let's say um a service a new department or something that's like a large like like wrong leader in the department or like where like uh, how big can the mistakes get and you feel like they're I celebrating almost. yeah yeah, they're not celebrating like that though. Like yeah. we're like, okay, bro, you failed. What did you learn? Yeah. So we we recap together. We're yeah. like, all right, man, let's go. You failed. What did you learn? Let's embrace it right now in this moment, and then let's leave it behind us and move forward. Yeah. But instead of coming down on somebody or writing them up or anything like that, what's the point in that? Because yeah. then you make them what fearful. Create an environment where they're able to set them up for success. But if they don't succeed and they fail beautiful things are, are born in those avenues. Why? Because they learned and they learned, but, but empower them and give them the direction to help figure those things out. Now, I will tell you, we're talking a lot about the wins, right? Let's, I have had failures as a leader 
You know, I have an, a, a teammate on staff right now where before I was Grasshopper, I actually had fired him uh, based off of some complaints that came in. I didn't do my job and fully investigate those complaints, and I ended up terminating him only to find out a week and a half later that I kind of was manipulated by the situation over here. He never did anything <coughs> wrong, and then I had to call somebody and apologize regardless if I wanted them to come back. I couldn't go to bed at night unless I called him and apologized. So I called him and I just said, look, man, I just was informed of X, Y, Z. I have to let you know I made a huge mistake. I hope that you'll forgive me. If you don't, I totally understand. My door is open to you. I hope that I can make this right for you. But if I can't, just know that I know that we're good. And if there's anything I can do or any hardships I've caused you, I'm here to make them right. And he, he came back and he's still with me to this day. And there's some bad decisions I made. And, you know, a part of leadership is believing in people. <laughs> and I guess a fault of mine is sometimes I believe in people to a fault, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I empower and empower and empower and I, I see it in them. But the problem comes when you see it in them more than they see it in them. Because you can't teach that. You can lead and you can coach and empower mm -hmm. toward that direction. But it's like when you pass the ball to someone, you can't make them take that ball and run with it. And I have had leaders in those positions and we do everything at all costs to try to move the seat on the bus before we would have to remove a seat on the bus. And, you know, there's a leader or two that are not here any longer that just, you know, those values, we choose growth. We commit every day to be a team player. We do what is right. Even when right is hard, they just couldn't keep the ball in their hand with that. And that's when I step in and I try my best, but there's times where I failed and, I put a leader I put a leader in a position where they they weren't quite ready to be a leader and, and that stuff sucks. It sure sucks. But I learned from it and I said, "Okay, but what are the good things that we learned from this? What are the good things we got out of it? What are the opportunities that this person was shown through this that'll help set them up for success in future career jobs that they might have?" Amanda, why are you special? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you you're built a little different. I'm built a little different. You know, look, Tim I don't have the stay weird tattoo for nothing. Let's go. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, but like, okay, the age thing kind of threw me off just because like how advanced you are as far as like your leadership ability and stuff like that. I have a leadership coach. Um, okay. You know, I haven't had the easiest life, Tim. And uh, I feel like through adversity, you learn how to be a different breed. And there's some people that fall victim to that. And there's other people that rise to the occasion and rise beyond that. And no matter what hurdle I've been thrown in life, I've always tried to rise to the occasion and then some. And, you know, even with this company, it's been a hard journey, but... Who's your leadership coach? My leadership coach, his name is Dean Lieber. Okay. Uh, I actually have him as a resource for my entire leadership team as well. Nice. That's cool. That's a nice benefit. Yeah. So that we're all speaking the same language and we're all growing as leaders just on different paths, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, the adversity thing, I'm not going to dive into that necessarily unless you wanted to, no, but we're cool. okay. I just, I guess I can tell yeah. something, you know, significant it's just people. I'm not a quit. You yeah. know, I'm not, I don't lose. I yeah. may fail and I may get knocked down, but I don't lose. Yeah. And, uh, I believe in myself and sense of security is very important to me. And, uh, you know, forward is a way of life. I, I hope that you can tell through what I'm saying. That's more than just words on the wall and more than just grasshoppers mm -hmm. moving. That's the story of my life. And mm -hmm. so when you ha have a company and you have something that you've been able to build and it has a, a purpose greater than who you are and a purpose that's really rooted in who you are and who you become, I mean, I love walking through the doors here every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so the core values stuff, yeah. and, and it's one, like talked about the the guy who sent me that video that like mm -hmm. wants to be like your company yeah. and also just there, everyone kind of reciting the core values. I think that that's the kind of the moment that touches people's hearts about that video yeah. that you guys did. Beautiful, by the way, that's Thank a great you. employee branding moment. Thank you. Incredible. How do you, like, how did you come up with those? Like, I, I understand that those yeah. are probably similar to what your personal core values are. Did you have, did you go through traction at all? In the US <laughs> no, or? I don't know like, what yeah. those are. Okay. But my leadership coach, Dean, uh, so, oh, damn, this was 2020, toward the end of 2020, uh, right in the beginning of 2021, before I became Grasshopper, I hired a leadership coach. 
Uh, cause again, like I said, I had done some stuff. I had terminated somebody and I'm like, I have such a great vision, but I can't figure out how to get there. Uh, so Dean, he's, he's so awesome. He came into my office and I was just proposing grasshopper values and I put them on the wall in my office. So I spelled out grasshopper and each letter was a word for, of a value. Right. And so I'm like, okay, is this going to be the value? So he come, you know, he sits at my desk and he's like, that's cool. What's that? And I was like, I think those are going to be our values. He's like, okay, tell me what they are. And I could memorize one of the words maybe. I was like, R, I think it was like reputation before profit or something. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, tell me another one. And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, those aren't your values. Mm -hmm. Your values are what you have to make every single decision based off of your company. When you establish those values, be prepared because you're going to have to hire on them and you might have to fire on them. But mm -hmm. those values are how you operate the company. Culture is values in action. And so I was like, okay, so it actually took me six months to nail down how I wanted to run this company tied in with the grasshopper theme. So then, um, I don't have the notebook with me, but I had a notebook and I just started writing down words over the course of like <coughs> the first three months that meant something to me. And so then I'm like, okay, got these words. And he's like, okay, circle the most, the five that are most important to you. So then I start to refine the words a little bit. Then I came up with like 20. He's like, okay, you can't have 20 values, five or six. I'm like, five or six? I can't come up with five or six. So um, from there, he's like, okay, narrow it down to 10. So I narrowed it down to 10. He's like, okay, how do you make your decision based off of the word integrity? I'm like, well, I don't really know. If this person does this person, if this does this, if we do this. And he's like, too gray. You've got to make it black and white. Everybody knows it. Everybody can memorize it. Everybody in your absence, if you got hit by a bus tomorrow, will be able to live this value out. And I'm like, okay. So I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I sit, sat with it for about another three months. And I personally came up with value statements instead of words, because how do you make a decision by, how do you fire somebody based off of the word integrity? Because your definition and my definition might be two different things, mm -hmm. right? Or how do you terminate somebody based off of profitability? right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to know what that means, but our six core values are, we believe in the power of strong partnerships. We choose growth. We do what is right. Even when right is hard, we serve above and beyond every time. Uh, we commit every day to be a team player and we work hard and we play hard. Those are it. Those are our six values and that's how we operate. And so we celebrate them all the time and we always refer back to them. So when somebody's out there and he goes to give a helping hand to another installer, when he finishes his, we shout them out in Slack. Hey man, Tyler just stepped up and he's committing to be a team player this afternoon, coming out to help his team. So we are constantly talking about them and it's constantly values in action here. You know, the hard part of those values is living up to them when it is hard, right? Kara up front, I love her. We talk about this story all the time. When we first got into um, being able to she finance. Is wild and kind of crazy and fun. She is. When we, and you know, most of my staff here had never been in the home service industry. So we've all learned and built this thing together. And uh, when we first got introduced to Good Leap Financing, there's this intricate part of it called NTP, which is notice to proceed. And you can't start a job without NTP because if you do and you don't have it and Good Leap says you're not getting it, you'll never get paid for the job. Hmm. So in the very beginning, we go rip out an air conditioning unit. Kara comes to my office and goes, um, we're on a job and I just realized we don't have NTP. I said, okay. She's like, I've already tried to call the client. The client is trying to get the money, but she doesn't really have the money and she's going to call her dad. And I just looked at her and I said, is that really fair to the client? What, do you, what, what, what should we be doing here? She's like, I don't know. Let me go talk to Brian. So they went and they wrangled up and they came back in here and they're like, Amanda, we really don't know what to do. She can't come up with the money. And I was like, guys, she's getting a free AC unit. We've already ripped the old one out. We don't want to put any pressure or stress on her because it's not her fault that we didn't follow our process. This was our negligence and it shouldn't be transferred over to her. So let her know she's getting a free air conditioning unit and that's on us. And that is what we serve above and beyond every time. And we do what is right, even when right is hard. And your teammates have to be able to see you living that out too. And they have to experience it. My installers came back and they were like, we can't believe you did that. She was in tears trying to figure out how she was going to pay for this. And it's like, that's our fault. That's not her fault. Mm -hmm. And so those values in action is imperative. Come to find out her dad owns a local pizza shop. 
has our has stacks of our business cards all the time and I've probably made more business off of that one mistake that we took a hit on than I would have with a negative review or them telling 10 more people mm. about how awful we treated them. So you've got to be able to live those out even when it's hard. Mm. I've got chills. That's really good. That's a good <laughs> example. Yeah. Um, anything else that you feel like you're doing here that would essentially like compared to other HVAC companies in the area yeah. that you feel like is making you guys a more attractive place to work? You know, um, I encourage people in their interviews to walk around the building and ask anybody any question that they want at any time during the interview, the beginning, the after part, because I don't want them. The most important thing to me is when they're sitting in an interview and if they make it to an interview with me that they not just hear the words I'm saying at that time, but that they'll feel them and experience them if they were to come onto the team and if that were to be a fit. And one thing I can tell you is that we care, we support them at relentlessly, and they have abundant resources to succeed, whether that's financially, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Uh, we have a mental, we have a, a mental health therapist on retainer that each and every grasshopper can access at any time. Hmm. And uh, we just simply get a bill for the hours every month, but we cover the hours. Uh, it's insurance barely covers mental health nowadays in terms of therapists, and it's really hard to find one. But we've got an immediate resource. Is and that like a service around the country, or is it one specific uh, therapist? No, it's a local therapist local here. Local therapist, okay. Because that awesome. sounds amazing. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah, she's awesome. But the thing is, is like life happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. And whether we like to admit it or not, it's that you could be coming in and having a bad day today because of 20 things going on in your personal life. And then work has expectations of you. And then everybody has expectations of you. And sometimes we don't, we can't come in and be at a hundred percent every day. Right. And the most important thing to us is if life happens or they're feeling like they're going in a downward spiral or they just need somebody to talk to, that they've got that resource available to them at any time. We have over 23 grasshoppers that utilize this every single week consistently on a week-to-week really? -week basis. And then there's people, look, when things happen or when they just need somebody to talk to, they'll resort, they'll access her and use her as a resource. And Can I ask how much your cost you guys? <laughs> um, I will tell you right now we're spending about 6000 a month. Okay. And for you, it feels like it's definitely worth it because your people are healthier. It's worth it because to be able to support people and meet them where they're at, mental health is a big big part of it mm -hmm. and school doesn't teach us the tools that we need to help navigate sometimes out of bad or hard things that have happened to us or out of when bad things happen to us that weren't expected or say somebody passes away which is inevitable for all of us and how do you deal with those things and have the toolbox to help get you through that like these are the levels that we go to as a company because when people are at the center of what you do psychology, emotional intelligence, and emotional well-being are, are top on the list. And if you're not focusing on those, you're missing the mark. Hmm. Yeah. Is there any, you had mentioned this leadership coach. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm curious, is there any other services in the industry that you'd like to shout out? Anybody else that's helped you guys get where you are? Just curious. Um, it's all good if there's no one. I, I feel like I'm, I might be forcing it a little bit. but No, you're good. You know, service MVP lately has probably been the second or third best business decision that I've ever made. Um, you know, I've hired other sales trainers in the industry and everybody's good, but who is a sales trainer or a uh, customer service experience coach that can actually provide you with deliverables on proven results and something to be able to refer back to on a metrics basis? Uh, I have not met any sales trainers up until service MVP where there's actual accountability in place, processes in place where you can actually look back and see the tangible results and the deliverables of that investment. For us, like service MVP, Joe Crisar, I love you. I'm going to make it transparent because this is for you, buddy. It's like $175,000 a year, right? I have made that back in the first 45 days and then some just through the additional service MVP side of it, not even the increased average ticket. And I'm kicking myself as to why I didn't do this a few years ago, because if I did, I can't even imagine how much further ahead I would be. And I think that, you know, Joe focuses a lot on psychology and a lot on diagnosing the homeowner, building the relationship, building trust. And 
if you're if you're striving to be at that premier level, service MVP is a must have that you have to be able to partner with. Mm. I dig it. Um, as far as like the the nitty gritty of that, how it plays into the company, mm -hmm. um, I, saw, I saw the training area and I saw that the you know the videos and stuff yep. like that. What else is all involved with what they're doing for you guys? Like what are like that's an incredible yeah um, increase. Mm -hmm. Just curious, like what are the other things that play into that? Yeah, so we um, actually we were able to now like host actual graduations when people graduate from the mm -hmm. training course, which is cool. I have people here that never even graduated from high school. So we have graduations every four weeks. We invite fam their family, their friends. We have breakfast here of celebration, champagne, orange juice, poppers, graduation music, a diploma. And for some of them, that's their only graduation ceremony that they may experience in their lifetime. And for some people, it's truly life-changing as silly as that sounds, but service MVP, not only uh, is leadership coaching, but it's CSR coaching, it's sales coaching, it's service coaching, it's maintenance coaching. Even the installers, I have 20 installers right now that are going through the service MVP process just for the customer experience in the home and what it looks like when that baton gets passed to their department to make sure that that homeowner is feeling a unified experience from start to finish with Grasshopper. Truly, it is the premier level of service when you're ready to get to that point. Mm. I love it. I, th I think the, like you're saying, the value to those employees, how good that will feel. How, yeah. Like it's so good to just have celebration moments mm -hmm. in your life and your career. Yeah. Like we like at a, we launch websites and we pop champagne just because partly, you know, the internet is ever changing Yeah. and it's out of date as soon as you freaking launch it. Right. right. But like, um, just to have some celebration moment and then we do something for social and stuff yeah. like that too. It's just good to like have these moments. Love it. Um, it feels good. It does because people yeah. are a part of something greater than themselves. Yeah. They're not just coming to a job. It's not just a career. It's not a title here. You're not just a number here. You're stepping into something that's greater than yourselves and you're a part of a greater mission. And when they feel, you know, we are so transparent about our numbers, about our goals, about our wins, about our losses, about our good days, about our hard days. And we embrace that and we celebrate that together. And when you um, are transparent and when you are vulnerable as a leader, to where everyone feels like they're an owner essentially the result is a beautiful thing awesome and i have a couple series on this podcast so please um bear with me i've got two um one the first one is is um, hot takes and cold trends mm. so what is a hot take that you have about the hvac industry mm -hmm. or the home services industry in general and then what's something a cold trend something that's people should stop wasting time, money, energy, or effort on? Ah, that's a good question. Good stuff for social. So I'm huge for hot trends through artificial intelligence right now. Yeah. Uh, CXC, I'm a co-founder of CXC. Uh, the website is cxc.ai, and it is really um, using artificial intelligence to enhance the customer experience, which ultimately will increase revenue. It's been an absolute game changer for us. And as a leader and as the owner of Grasshopper, I'm committed to bringing in as much artificial intelligence and innovation into the company as I can. In fact, I hope to be able to spearhead a lot of that throughout even just HVAC for myself. What does that mean right now? I don't quite know, but this is the year that I'm diving into it. Um, cold trend, I would say. Stop wasting time, money, energy, or effort on this. Oh, damn. It's okay to be spicy here with us. You're scared. Um, I would say, honestly, mine is on vendors that aren't willing to jump into a partnership with you where it's a two-way street instead of a one-way street. I know a lot of people are loyal to relationships or loyal to a brand of equipment. This is 2024. It's no longer about the brand of equipment. People are buying an experience, and so it's the experience in your brand that they're buying, not the piece of equipment. Mm. I like that. Yeah. So the next um, little section we've got is called There's Money in the Phones, sponsored by Power Selling Pros. I love Brigham. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, why do you love Brigham? <laughs> That's good. I listen. met him at the CXC booth, actually, yeah. in Austin. Yeah. Um, he came up and he introduced himself. We go back and forth here and there. Just a super awesome dude. Yeah, seems very, very nice. Um, what is something that people could do to improve their phone answering systems that you highly recommend? Ask the age of the system that they're calling about. 
Mm. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe the amount of number of people that I talk to that that's not even a part of their phone script. How do you understand the opportunity in front of you if you don't understand the age of the system? Mm. That's really good. What he does is he teaches the most valuable team in your business. He'll just add nothing but profit. There's so much money left in the call center. So much money. If you're not at a 90% booking rate, showing empathy on the phone, smiling on the phone, making sure they're having a better day after they got off the phone with you, then you need to call Power Selling Pros and see Brady. Questions from the audience. By the way, when I ask questions, I'm really gonna be here. I'm really gonna ask, ask your questions. And as you may know, Amanda's not like super on the internet. She's got a crazy, <laughs> awesome company to run out here. So, but the, one of them was a bit, your biggest challenge for 2024. Yeah. So my biggest challenge for 2024 is going to be getting the plumbing department up and operational and hopefully be able to surpass some goals quicker than we did with HVAC. And what I mean by that is just simply learning from the mistakes we made along the way with HVAC taking into account processes, pricing, procedures, um, profitability, and being able to really hit the ground running with that department to have a really healthy department within the first 365 days. And like I was saying before, sometimes it makes you question like, how did I do this again with mm. HVAC? But it's making sure we launch it the right way. And I have been, I have been cautious to go into plumbing because they say, you know, stick with what you're good at and master it. But to be able to take over a little bit more market share, I see that it's necessary in our area. And so luckily I found some really great people to help pioneer that department with me, but it is absolutely going to be starting another department within Grasshopper from the ground up. And any other things that made, went into that decision? You said take over more market share. Mm -hmm. How did you really make that choice about whether to do plumbing? So we're gonna, there's some bigger companies around me as well, but they've been here a long time. And eventually we're gonna reach a plateau, right? On being able to take over market share. Around year five to six, we expect that plateau to possibly hit. And to be able to continue reaching more people and to be able to continue serving more uh, customers in our community, we've got to be able to continue innovating and finding ways to be able to reach more people. And for us, it's going to be plumbing and then adding in electrical. It just reminds me so much of what I'm trying to do from roofing to HVAC because <laughs> I said the same thing. It was like five years and I think I see where we're going to get a little clustered in yeah. areas with this, the one niche. So yeah, just definitely relate. Um, and I'm sure, you know, whether it's you're adding plumbing or you're yep. adding a new market or you're adding, and for me, I'm adding a niche. Yeah. It's just that you go through a lot of, it's like humbling. Yep. Um, and what do you feel like a little out of your um, depth at right now in that? With plumbing? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Can I tell you that I mastered HVAC and learned HVAC from the ground up myself? And really by answering phones, uh, I was able to learn how to like troubleshoot and learn what's what. With plumbing, I feel like a deer in headlights a little bit. And it's been a rather humbling experience for me because I am having to lean on other people for answers and like, well, what is this? Or what does this mean? Well, what is encompassed in this plumbing repair? Or what's with this with HVAC? You can ask me something I can tell you like that. Mm -hmm. Plumbing is like, I feel like it's all brand new. And so it's a whole new learning curve for me, which is awesome and I'm excited. Uh, but it comes with a challenge. It's kind of fun to be it like, you know, like if you feel like you're kind of reaching a level of mastery at your main yeah. thing and to mm -hmm. like take off that like and just go back and be a beginner and like, yeah. and sometimes I've also heard people say that like because you don't know every last detail down to the very little nitty gritty of the, yeah. the work that it can be freeing in a way because you just focused on the numbers. Right. As a business owner, you can just say, or if the numbers are wrong, yeah. And I'm going to need you to fix it, but you don't, you don't have an emotional connection to that work. No, it's uh, it's, it's an experience for me, but yeah. it's awesome. Are, do you think you're going to go down and like get the nitty gritty no. down to the, okay, cool. I heard something about a pipe and they found like yeah. shit in it the other yeah. day. And I'm you're like, just like, I'm no not going nitty gritty. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cool. Like yeah. my friends will send me a video. Hey, what's wrong with my system? Or you can call me and say, this is what's going on and I'm able to like get it down to, mm. if it's an electrical short, I can get you within like two to three options of what it could mm. be, but I can diagnose most things by phone, like plumbing. Not so sure I want to know what all the diagnostics are there. I am, I am predicting massive profit 
I hope so. I'm predicting incredible success in the next couple of years because I think that there is something to not being, not knowing it at such a granular level yeah. that you just push it through by metrics. Listen, I can lead them strong. I can trust that they know what they're doing. I can help with the profitability and they can take the ball and run with it. Yeah. I love it. And then the other one was, what's the big goal for 2024? The big goal revenue wise or my goal? Sure. Both. Our goal is 25 million this year. And the goal for me is to maximize our net profitability and increase our EBITDA percentage. And so I am committed to the year of profit to be able to get that higher. Now, for us, right, we went from 2.8 to 15 plus million in less than three years. And uh, there is some scalability that grows into that. So understanding the line between what scalability you want to hit as a company and then understanding that that could or could not take a hit on your net profit and where that line is for you, where you're comfortable, that's been something that I've constantly been diving into now. Numbers are my background, obviously. And numbers are, I, I eat, sleep, breathe, and study numbers. And so for me, it's constantly monitoring that line on, do we want to scale quickly or do we want to scale reasonably and keep our net profit high? Mm. There's a balance, but some people make the sacrifice and all power to them, but this is a year of profit for me. I think uh, I, I appreciate that. I think I also do think it's a theme a little bit right now with some of like the the compression that seems to be happening yeah. with lower leads or you know for some people more people yeah. seem to be pushing into that a little bit right yeah, now. Yeah, and for 2024, you know, it is an election year, and 2023 was a weird year. Um, mm. You know, our goal was 20 million in 2023, and by early summer uh, with the weather and even just with leads down. We saw that we weren't gonna hit that, but we knew we were still gonna strive like hell to get as close as possible. But buying trends were just off in the summertime. It was strange. Mm -hmm. Like we had our highest performing month in October. Mm -hmm. What? We're in upstate New York where it's mild, it's, it's not too hot, but it's not too cold. There's no demand at all. So um, it's been a year. I predict 2024 to be very similar. So we're focusing on all the KPIs and maximizing every opportunity that's in front of us. Instead of turning the dial up on marketing, we're focusing on what's right in front of us. I love it. Um, all right. So I think that that's everything I wanted to ask. I really appreciate you having me at the office. Absolutely. And um, thank you for joining us. What could people go do to support Grasshopper or check you guys out? Yeah, absolutely. They can visit us at gograshopper.com. I'm happy to help out, answer any emails. You can find me on Facebook. I'm not the best with Facebook Messenger, but my email is amanda at gograshopper.com. And uh, yeah, I would love to connect and, and help any way I can. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, it, the podcast is put on by hookagency.com. Hook, uh, <coughs> Hook agency all over social. And uh, appreciate you. Bye. Cool. Thanks. <laughs>